All right, so for CTO Crossing, the, the, the uh, primary uh, sh um, goal is to establish wire access from true lumen to true lumen. This is necessary to proceed to definitive therapy. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about true lumen and grade crossing, but you also have the other uh, opportunity to get retrograde access and cross true lumen retrograde. Uh, we, can also, we also talk about subentimal dissection and reentry. But a lot of the times we utilize all three strategies in cases, in everyday cases that are complex. What affects crossing success? So we talked about length of lesion, flush occlusions, collaterals right at the proximal cap, severe calcification is a huge one. And we talked a little bit about cap morphology and shape and uh, different classifications. So whether it's concave, convex, such as the C-top classification. So true lumen, you know, is taking advantage of the mode of occlusion. So typically you have a critical stenosis that eventually occludes with uh, thrombosis. The center lumen, true lumen may be softer than the surrounding fibrocalcific plaque, and we're making use of the microchannels in the true lumen. The potential advantages, uh, you may have less <clears throat> resistant disease at the reentry site that may need less scaffolding. Uh, there may be less medial or adventitial damage if you're in true lumen. And the question is, does this have implication on pain C rates? And again, in what I've seen, there hasn't been a lot of good data showing that subentimal uh, or medial or adventitial damage uh, is necessarily negatively affects patency. But if you do want to do the true lumen approach, you really want to decide early before going subintimal because as the previous speaker said, uh, if you do go subintimal, most of the time it's a little bit too late to come in with a crossing uh, catheter uh, because everything's going to go subintimal. Uh, typically, you're using lower profile wires, 014018 systems, uh, like the wires that were talked about previously. Uh, using crossing catheters may increase your uh, chance of true lumen crossing, uh, but definitely do add cost to the procedure. A true lumen approach definitely takes patience and persistence. Uh, usually ends up taking more time and costing more, and uh, there's a high crossover rate uh, into the subintimal approach. So again, subintimal approach is what I use, like John uh, talked about earlier. First described in the late 80s by Bolia and Rikers. It's a wire loop technique that takes a subintimal plane. It uh, theoretically circumvents the plaque and calcification and could potentially allow better expansion of balloons and stents. It's usually more exp expeditious time-wise, especially for long, complex uh, chronic total occlusions. And most of the time, we do have spontaneous reentry, but if not, reentry devices are available or retrograde access is available to, uh, to bail you out. So theoretical disadvantages, higher risk of perforation, uh, depending on how far out, how far subentimal or intramedial you are. Um, you have a possible occlusion of the collaterals. Uh, potentially riskier use of atherectomy devices. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you personally, if I'm subentimal, I would still use an atherectomy device if I think it's appropriate. Um, I'm using less atherectomy at times now than five years ago because we do have the DCBs and DES. But, uh, you know, directional atherectomy, I think, is still fairly safe if you are subentimal. Most of the time, you can tell which side you're subentimal, so you cut away, away from the, uh, uh, the side that you are uh, closer to the outside. Um, and you probably more likely need stents at the reentry sites, and this has been my experience. And the question is, is there lower patency rates? And again, I haven't seen a whole lot uh, to support that. So just a couple of uh, articles back in 2007 looking at uh, sort of midterm patency rates with a subintimal approach versus intraluminal. This looked at 52 patients had a subintimal intervention versus 54 patients had intraluminal intervention, and the intervention was mostly stent. You can see long lesions, comparable lengths, um, and you can see technical success was similar. And looking at 12-month patency rates, in this study, the uh, subintimal approach actually had higher uh, patency rates at one year, uh, as treated 76.4% versus 59.2%. This article by Soga has already been uh, uh, referenced twice. Uh, it's a fairly large data set, 900 patients. You can see the success rate was uh, similar at 90 and 91%. Complications rates were very similar. And there was no difference in primary, assisted primary, or secondary patency rates at three years. There was no difference in survival or limb salvage at three years. And uh, you can see here 25% crossover rate. Uh, so again, even uh, when they started with intraluminal approach, many crossed over into a subintimal approach. What they did find was procedure time was significantly longer for an intraluminal approach, 126 minutes versus 98 minutes, again, high crossover rate. And this study was done in Japan, so they did not have CTO uh, crossing devices or reentry devices. So when they couldn't get across antegrade, they got retrograde access. But in, with that strategy, the equipment cost was uh, significantly more by about $1,000 in the intraluminal approach. 
Uh, and also they make a, a good distinction here, you know, interluminal versus subintimal approach because most of the time when we think we're subintimal or interluminal, we may not be completely interluminal the entire way. And the only way to know this is, uh, you know, if you IVIS uh, your path and take a look. And most of the time, uh, you know, even when you think you're fully interluminal, you have uh, portions that are subintimal and vice versa. Uh, this is one study that actually looked, uh, again, done in Japan, looked at um, cases where they did a looped wire technique uh, purposely and uh, to go subintimal. Uh, they looked at 57 patients with an 035 looped wire technique. Uh, and they confirmed their position after crossing with um, IVIS and also angioscopy. Here's an example of an intraluminal uh, on the left panel, subintimal in the middle, and a intramedial panel on the right. And the left uh, angioscopy shows thrombus, ulcerated plaque, and other debris that's in the true lumen. The second one is subintimal where you have a fairly smooth uh, pathway. Uh, and the third, an inter intramedial, they described as rough and, and relatively small. And after crossing with a cross, uh, with a looped wire technique, you can see how many were actually uh, subintimal. 52% uh, were subintimal by the distal segment. 28% uh, were intramedial, but there were still 20% that were actually still in, uh, in the true lumen despite using the uh, um, looped wire technique. And then lastly, this study, um, which looked at the uh, same sort of thing, uh, long chronotal occlusions using IVIS, 49 lesions uh, treated with bare metal stent, uh, long lesions, and restenosis here was likely, uh, was more likely associated with either a smaller distal cross-sectional area, but also an intramedial wire path, not necessarily an, a subintimal. So it looks like the further out you go and there is some uh, damage to the media, you may have more restenosis. So in conclusion, I think it's important to distinguish that intraluminal uh, versus subintimal approach may be different from the actual pathway of the wire. Uh, both have very high technical success rates and similar complication rates. There does not appear to be any appreciable difference in patency, at least from my uh, you know, view of the literature. Um, but I do think the intro lumen approach takes more time, uses more wires, and has a high crossover rate. And implications with new, newer technology like DCB are still unknown at this time. Thank you.